Hello, everybody, and thanks for attending today's session, um, today's equity lecture on, on um, and light lecture on equity and um, technology in science. Um, we have three very, very, very different talks today um, by Birgit Schmidt of the University of Göttingen, by Stephen Kaluvert of the University of Ghent, and by myself. We will dive right in into this hour. And afterwards, after these three talks, we will, we will have the time to also ask some questions, which you can just type in into the chat and I will read them out if you want to. We will start with Dr. Birgit Schmidt, who coordinates um, international and national open science activities and projects and leads the unit knowledge commons at Göttingen State and um, University Library. Her activities focus on policies e-infrastructures and training in support of the implementation of open science. In a night rise, she leads open science work package and contributes to, as a co-lead to a work package on digital research infrastructures. She also contributes to several international committees and working groups. She serves on the European Commission's Horizon 2020 expert group on the future of scholarly publishing and scholarly communication, Knowledge Exchange Open Access Expert Group and the Belmont Forum's Working Group on Open Data. Previously, she acted as a scientific manager of the European Open Air Project and as an executive director of the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. She holds a degree in mathematics and philosophy of the University of Bielefeld, as well as a postgraduate degree in library and information science from, the univers from Humboldt University in Berlin. Please give a visual or virtual applause to Birgit. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, and for, intro for introducing me. And thank you for the, uh, thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to present today. Let me uh, share the right screen, <laughs> which is always so. Let me see. So that seems to work. So today I will speak about, um, I hope you're not disturbed by any black block box on my uh, slides. Um, I will talk about equity gaps in open science. And I I guess, oh, what is this? So most of you will be familiar with certain um, strands of open science, which is an umbrella term of, of many activities, including open access to publications, but also open and fair data, open educational resources, which might play also a role in, in the light consortium and many other things. And many of us have, of course, different starting points when it comes to open science. I mean, for me, with my mathematics background was at some point I started reading preprints. Um, and this point when I was doing my PhD, of course, I never shared any <laughs> preprint or because we were not um, supposed, um, or we were not, publishing at this stage, but some of you might at some point um, start publishing in open access journals or publishing a book in open access mode. And um, the term uh, reproducibility is perhaps also familiar to you when it comes to yeah, combining data codes and um, making research um, more transparent in the sense that you can go through results um, based on all ingredients of, of your findings. So, and open science is um, in, a, in a way a culture change where the top down and the bottom up level meets and um, many activities are of course that you say, okay, you need some infrastructure to, and tools to make this happen, but you um, might also need some incentives which come from the top and policies might also help on, um, in the sense of giving some orientation on what is desired um, behavior which is of course not just uh, driven by the top, but very much driven by the discipline, by the research community uh, people are working in. So in some fields, preprints, for example, have taken up um, um, popularity in the last few years, psychology, medicine, also related to the COVID crisis. And then you might also sometimes run into some issues or when it comes to there are lots of benefits, but there might also be some challenges. So benefits include, of course, to say, OK, um, you have access to research results. You can use them. You can cite them, might make your research more efficient. You might have access to research data, which otherwise not would have not been available to you. 
um, or there might be economic uh, effects in the sense that application of research um, gets easier. And when it comes to the Enlight Consortium, um, you haven't heard an introduction to the whole thing um, in this lecture, but you know, we are a partner, Alliance of Nine Universities, and we have a um, project which looks into a, creating a joint research and innovation agenda. And in this context, we uh, conducted a survey asking um, the partners, and it was not the researchers, it was basically people who have a broad knowledge on what's what's actually provided and what is available in the institutions so what policies are in place what infrastructures um excuse me and so we have a um diversity um lots of commonalities but also diverse um infrastructures in place diverse um, policy in place so we we looked into for example open education research data management, open access, and there was agreement that the level of activity uh, for open access is uh, rather uh, established, or, which is the bottom line in the figure I added here. And there might be areas where it's a bit more patchy, like in open education, for example, some institutions feel there is room for uh, stepping up activities. So, and I, in this sense, also already shared um, my data and my code <laughs> when I created this. Um, this little survey. So um, what are equity gaps in open science? They are often related to access to funds, to resources, but also this is about um, how much time do you have? How much time can you invest in these activities? Are you busy with teaching? Are you busy with other obligations? Or is someone telling you, okay, you should concentrate on a specific thing and not um, debate too much time on, on such activities? But on the other hand, it's it's um, um, something which make uh, makes your research workflow um, streamline certain things when you think about sharing early on or managing uh, data early on, and not just as an afterthought because it was part of a third party funded project. So and all this gets easier when there's infrastructure, when there's services from the institution. But there's, of course, also different starting points depending on what's uh, your career stage, what's um, uh, your gender, what's your ethnicity, or what's your discipline. So, and a couple of challenges are visualized here in this um, little figure, which comes from a, a more popular article, not digging deep in the sense of um, not a study, but um, you might have come across concerns related to being scooped around, for example, when you share data or when you uh, share um, review report related to a paper, being vulnerable as an um, early career researcher is here, of course, uh, a concern. And then um, effects might also be uh, getting stronger, that you have good and bad effects of someone benefits more if um, the institution is well equipped or um, or the other way around. So, and I'd like to dig a little deeper in open access to publications because yeah, this is like the, the area which is familiar to, to most of, of um, our listeners today. So there are um, routes to open access which are available to everyone in the sense um, sharing papers uh, can happen through a repository. So, um, publication repositories, there's um, disciplinary ones, but also overarching ones like uh, Zenudo, for example, you might have come across um, um, examples in your own field. Open Science Framework is popular in psychology, for example. Uh, but then you have to basically also think, oh, what version can I share based on a publishing contract or early stages? If it's a preprint, there's no... Um, the rights are still with the author, so we have the freedom to share, but on the other end, the journal might not like it. So, or, or your co-authors, of course, you have to check with everyone if they are fine to, to share your work in this, uh, in this way. And then again, um, when it comes to publishing in open access journals, in particular in the science technology medicine uh, field, you might run into costs um, called article processing chargers. And these are also 
um, not stable, they are rising over time. So this data was collected uh, from institutions which in, um, have publication funds uh, on an institutional or national level, and they share this data in a common pool. And you can see on the left-hand side a display of what's the uh, mean fair um, publication fee for fully open access journals. It's, it's pretty close to 2,000 euros on average. And when it comes to journals which are so-called hybrid open access journals. These are journals which are subscription based, but you can unlock individual articles when you pay a fee. The fee is even higher. It's yeah, was on average 56% higher. And this gap is somewhat closing because um, the growth on the left-hand side it's, is somewhat um, stronger than on the, on the right-hand side. Um, so this is certainly an issue. Um, but there's also, of course, issues which come with the publication market. So as you all know, publishers are competing for attention. Uh, once uh, our branding journals are um, through their, their indicators, like the journal impact factor, attract authors, and they also compete for reviewers. Um, and um, these are, of course, common issues which are not related to open access, but some others, other issues um, can be related to open access, the mentioned publication fees, but also um, journals which are have emerged over the last um, two decades, which piggyback on the article processing model, which offer a kind of easy route to publishing for a rather small fee, but uh, with only low quality peer review, and publishing services. So the so-called questionable publishers or predatory publishers. So, and with the fee model, you um, easily, when um, authors come from institutions in, uh, yeah, well-funded institutions, they will likely not be able to get a fee waiver. They have to look um, around for where does the money come from? There are waivers for people where the GDP of in the country is low or reduced fees, but this is certainly not a sufficient solution for yeah this this prohibitive um, article process and charges model. Um, in the on merit project, um, um, which I would like to say a few words about, there's also reports out there which were created. This was a research project um, which ended early this year. Um, sociological, bibliometric, computational methods were uh, applied in the sense of we looked for Matthew effects related to open science uh, inequities. Um, and um, one example here, um, one outcome was that um, higher ranked institutions, and this was, um, it was the line ranking which was applied here, um, use open access papers more and they also consume them more. So uh, producing means publishing, of course, and uh, consumption makes um, means citation here. And also there were effects of that well-resourced actors are more likely to publish in journals with on the high fee scale. You might remember the fee thing. There's lots of outliers to to the to the top. <laughs> so on the high um, high end, this um, can be quite expensive. Some publishers even charge um, yeah in the in the ten ten thousand um, dollars is is at the very high end, for example. Um, so and the um, project also looked into differences um for certain discipline areas so here the figure is about um, sustainable development goals areas and um again um certification in terms of when it comes to um the the ranking of the institutions based on how many how high cited high cited papers they have so the top 10 cited papers was used to kind of uh, classify the institutions um, and then you see for some of the SDG areas, it's quite clear cut that those who are in the high ranks um, publish more, uh, a higher share of open access papers, but for other SDG areas, like for climate action, it's um, more varying in the sense it might in some years uh, be the less resource, which makes perfect sense, of course, with the topic uh, published more in this, in this area. 
So it, this is the um, differences you will always see uh, when it comes to uh, disciplines. So, and finally on merit also came up with um, um, a summary report, some recommendations, and they of course address, um, yeah, come up with some pointers on how um, these, these differences, um, inequalities could be, um, inequities could be addressed. Um, first of all, to get, a, I mean, keep, uh, keep uh, the institution and um, more broadly, of course, funders, uh, other players here, uh, up to date in terms of what is actually paid to to publishers, what are the um, greater transparency in this field, and then um, also stepping into um, supporting alternative publishing models where the, there's some cost control in terms of author facing charges the, or even no charges, the so called diamond open access journals, typically independent journals, which are hosted by institutions um, where where there's an agreement um, with consortia, other, other funding models, which avoid this um, article processing uh, barrier. So this is um, just a glimpse into what um, this uh, report was about, but I have a couple of pointers for you also in terms of further reading. And uh, please also have a look at the video, which summarizes um, the approach and some of the findings. Thank you very much for listening and any comments, of course, can be put into the chat um, and I think they will be addressed later. <laughs> so, stop sharing. Thank you so much, Birgit, for this brilliant start and your presentation and for the brilliant timekeeping. Thank you so much. And I will follow and introduce myself. Um, I'm Julia Giese. I'm a lecturer at the Diversity Research Institute at the University of Göttingen, as well as a research associate at Loughborough University's Center for Communication and Culture. Um, my research focuses on media work and cultural memory, as well as creative and digital methodologies. And I'm currently working on a research project um, entitled Digital Media Participation and Political Culture, which is led by Professor Aswin Punatambeka and funded by the British Academy, and I will present some work of this project. So I will present a rather new paper we have out entitled Curating New Ethnicities in a Digital Era, Women and Media Work in the British South Asian Diaspora, which I published together with Asim Kunatambet and Divas Bisht in the Journal of Cultures, International Journal of Cultural Studies, which is not open access. Um, this article analyzes the unfolding impact of technologies um, and specifically social media on, on the politics of ethnicity and gender in the UK. And we do so in revisiting Stuart Hall's foundational work on new ethnicities. And as well, we built on recent critiques, anti-racist critiques and feminist critiques on the politics of recognition and politics of visibility, specifically in the British context. And we ask or we explore how British South Asian women navigate new opportunities um, kind of provided by these um, technologies and the digitalization of media platforms. To give you a bit of context, well, our starting point was in 2015-16 in Britain, in which polarized debates on Brexit as well as really strong anti-migrant sentiments dominated the public discourse in, in the UK, as well as, of course, in other European countries, as we know. At the same time, we have a very, very popular um, reality TV show coming up called The Great British Bake Off, which is set in the British countryside in a tent, widely decorated with Union Jacks and kind of very nostalgic of Britain's great past. This year, we had three final contestants, which are, were rather unusual. We had Ian Cummings, a stay-at-home dad, we had Tamar Ray, a gay doctor of Indian parents, and as well as Nadia Hussein, a daughter of Bangladeshi migrants um, that were set to define the nation. And it was this charged context that it was kind of surprising to see Nadia Hussein, the woman in the middle, who then won the Great British um, Bake Off, becoming kind of like a cultural celebrity and was called like the ambassador of, of migrant success, the um, ambassador of British Muslims. At the same time, we observe, of course, the rise of, of streaming platforms, of social media platforms, 
And it was striking to us to see that in the 2010s, we have had an increasing number of um, of uh, media workers that we could not really see in traditional media, such as television. Um, the increasing numbers of those South Asian, British South Asian, but also Black British um, media workers were specifically striking because, of course, they were lacking elsewhere. And it is in this background that we went back to a paper of Stuart Hall that he wrote in the 80s, in which he observed the changing television landscape at the time with television films, of course, such as My Beautiful Laundrette, and said that he finds that there is a shift in representation of blackness. And for Stuart Hall, blackness, of course, meant both British Asian and British Caribbean. He says there's not only possibility of access to representation, but there is finally a moment where representation can be contested, can be renegotiated through the medium of television. And this would give rise to a new ethnicity, which is not just an articulation of anti-racism, but actually is um, defining something on its own. So we are wondering basically if our new technologies, if social media today allows for such curation of new ethnicities, or, and there is of course people that have described the the situation a bit more from the grim side. We have, of course, looked at the scholarship on race and on feminist scholarship who have found that there is some sort of post-racial society today in which inequalities, racial inequalities, ethnic inequalities are claimed to be based on technology, on technological neutrality, whether it's an over aesthetization of blackness, of Asianness on Instagram or appropriation without really grappling the historic roots or the, the histories of such ethnicities. At the same time, we have feminist scholarship who, especially on post-feminism, popular feminism, who observe kind of these brand-ready um, articulations of femininity, which are very, very visible, but of course, very measured by the metrics of popularity, by the measure of how, how can they be consumed, how can they be marketed. And it's against this backdrop of scholarship that we try to figure out if there might be a more positive or more optimistic note in this kind of how Guru called it a race-friendly capitalism or a woman-friendly capitalism. And in our paper, we did so focusing on three media workers, Nadia Hussein, Amina Khan, and Hanam Kao, to examine how technologies have, or if technologies have opened spaces for a new creation of ethnicity. First of all, we have Amina Khan, a British Indian um, content creator, uh, she mostly works on Instagram and YouTube and posts videos and posts there or, um, for more than for 10 years now. Her videos um, deal with religion, with makeup, with styling, but also with her family and her children. She attracts followers by producing content in multiple languages, in English, of course, but also in Urdu and Hindi and Arabic, which, of course, attracts quite a wide and um, international following to her work. Um, and she also largely, of course, sustains her work with brand partnerships um, such as Bumble, Bobby Brown and L'Oreal. She's very aware of algorithmic logics. She navigates different platforms and advertises her work on Twitter and Snapchat to kind of to attract um, followers coming to different platforms. She started off um, kind of very, very focusing on her Muslim identity, but through the years, um, has kind of criticized that over that kind of overly focus on that ident that part of her identity. And in 2020, in a video that has gotten viral, um, she decided or shared her decision to not wear the hijab anymore. Her work now reflects an understanding of a media persona that centers on being a successful wife and mother with little attention paid to how her ethnicity or religion might shape the picture. The second persona we we focus on is Nadia Hussein, who of course won the Great British Bake Off, but today is a host and producer of many different programs on the BBC as well as on Netflix. She's also the author of a couple of books as well as a model and spokesperson. She um, supports her media work, her very extensive media work through social media on a very, very successful profile and her posts are a careful mixture of personal stories and brand partnerships that taken together kind of present a persona who's British, who's middle class, who's a woman and also happens to be Bangladeshi and Muslim. She doesn't produce um, any content in any other language um, than English and she does not talk about her religious practices. Um, so she kind of is in the representation of Tehran of British middle classness altogether. Um, her, 
her work has really changed over the years. While in the beginning, as you can see in the first picture, um, the visual, her visual markers of religion looked a certain way. Now they look another way. There is like an aesthetic change, but also the topics she talks about really changed. Well, she in the beginning really talked only about cooking and baking. Now she, especially in partnership with friends, um, notably Swarovski, she where she advertises their crystals. Why she speaks about issues such as racism, Islamophobia, colorism, as well as mental health issues. Um, last but not least, we have Hanam Kao. Hanam Kao is a Punjabi British. British Punjabi body positivity activist, model and spokesperson who was diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome at the age of 12, which kind of comes with a wide array of symptoms. Um, and for some people includes an um, excess of facial hair. She wears a full beard since she's 16 and took to social media to speak about her experience and to raise awareness. She uses her social media, mostly Instagram, to, for her activism, but not only. She also talks about her travels, about the makeup she uses, she, about the fashion she likes. So not like in the, the Cosmopolitan cover we can see. So there is this fashion aspect. But um, the, the logic of entrepreneurial feminism maybe don't really cover it fully for her. With her way she presents herself, um, for example, with her with her dog, a Rottweiler, how she trains the dog, as well as um, she shows herself a shooting range and getting tattoos. Um, then her, of course, visible Sikh identity in which she wears uh, the Dumala, the turban, but while pairing it with like Bindi, she has this kind of very glamorous but subversive take of what it means to be a British woman, what it means to be a South Asian British woman. So she kind of put, um, puts herself in this transnational sphere and really pushes the boundaries of um, gender in that case. To talk about our findings, taken together these three media workers offer really a striking case for representation and undeniably they are very successful. Our question, however, is does this newfound representation, does this newfound recognition really allow for, for the politics of of shaping this representation. And the first thing we noted is the space, of course, which is the space of production of our social media, how this technology works, it kind of puts the production space in the home. And that really fits neatly with this kind of post-feminist notion of the practices of the home. Now they're cooking, they're preparing the house, they're preparing their makeup to get ready for the outside. So they're kind of really embracing these very gender practices which of course is paired with these po popular feminist practices of dealing with these thorny issues, um, like gendered issues, the, being an empowered woman, being an empowered um, Muslim woman. So they're dealing with these issues and I kind of really position themselves in this field of commodity activism, which of course can be easily criticized at the same time. I think um, it is just revealing, or we found it was just revealing of the compli complicated processes in which ethnicities and genders are worked out through social media today, not through the rejection of these platforms, of these technologies, but by kind of incorporating and playing with them. And as well, specifically for Hussein and Khan, it is important to acknowledge the Muslim identities, which especially for Muslim women, we, we know that there's a lot of anxiety within integrationist um, policies and politics um, and media discourses of how does that Muslim woman fit within our public sphere. So these women, by kind of performing these femin feminine tasks of cooking, of, of keeping the house, but performing as Muslim women, visually as Muslim women, they're really kind of performing a Britishness differently, we find. So in this way, they really do neg negotiate something. However, there are boundaries to that. And that can really be observed in the, unfortunately be observed in the media work of Amina Khan, who was a, a hair model for L'Oreal. And that notably, um, she was the first hair model of L'Oreal wearing a hijab. She um, lost that gig after just a year, after a right-wing newscaster, Taka Carlson, based in the US, uncovered tweets of her that she had... Um, published four years earlier and criticized the Israeli government after bombing a children's hospital. After these were uncovered, she had to step down and did not only have to, I mean, lost that gig, but she also had to manage her sentiments widely and lost, of course, a lot of followers. So we see that Muslimness can really unsettle the notion of what it means to be a British middle-class woman in the media sphere. And it can be 
kind of um, punished. The same thing we find when it comes to sexuality and Hanam Kao. In contrast to Kao, uh, to the other two, Kao really performs her gender identity and as well as sexuality extremely differently and that in a way that the logics of branding and branded diversity cannot fully kind of control anymore. Being a bearded woman that talks about sex toys, that uh, talks about not being married and having sex, changing partners does not only unsettle what it means to be a British woman, but also what it means to be a South Asian woman, right? So kind of these queer figures, of course, we see a proliferation of these in our media sphere, and that shows that these can be kind of accommodated as well. But um, arguably, um, people like how really, really challenged that, we think. And while they're enabled by entrepreneurial feminism, we think that they do negotiate um, what it means to be an ethnicized woman in the UK. So to conclude, coming back to all reflections, um, his reflection on new ethnicities in the 1980s focused on this two-part problem of getting access and then can you bargain this access? Can you negotiate this access? We think today on a very, very kind of cautiously optimistic note that this is possible. We think that these three media work can become subjects of their own imaginaries, of their own desires and their own anxieties. And they are able to shape their identities, even if within very clear structures. We think that, that these new technologies really show us that we cannot, we cannot deny anymore that these people are there, like they're not marginalized in the space themselves. They can use the, the, these technologies. However, as I've also hopefully have shown, this is deeply ambivalent and we clearly do not live in a post-racial or post-racial world as some people in technology might someone sometimes think they do. Thank you so much. And that was it of me. And if you have questions, you can just type them into the box. And now we have our third speaker. Stephen Kalovet. Stephen has a PhD on, finished a PhD on the scalability of weather models on supercomputers and focuses in his research on climate change and urban climate. He's an assistant professor um, affiliated to the University of Ghent at the Department of Physics and Astronomy and works as well as the Royal, Meteor Royal Meteorological Institute of Belgium. Last year, he received a science communication award for the Vlinda project he's currently coordinating. Thanks a lot uh, for, the, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen first. Uh, okay, so good evening. Um, I think I will bring quite a, quite a different uh, talk um, than, than the two previous talks. So I'm working as a, as a climate scientist and we, I'm going to bring you tonight the story of our citizen science project called uh, Vlinder. And for this project, we uh, worked together with schools, with high schools to um, set up an, uh, a network of weather stations to um, fill some observational gaps that, that we had. And so the, the project that I'm going to present is the, is the work of, of many people. And I have added a few names on the slides, but there are, there are many more. I would first like to um, give you some, some, some background about this, um, about this project. So in meteorology, we are collecting observations. And one of the ways to do so is by using the traditional uh, weather stations. Most of these uh, weather stations are located in open rural environments. And the reason for this is that we have to follow um, guidelines from the World Meteorological Organization. And so they describe what type of location you should put your weather station at. And um, in practice, this means that you, uh, you should try to avoid any, um, any obstacles like houses or trees. So in reality, most of the national weather services, they put all their weather stations in open rural environments. However, we have many other landscapes like cities or forests, and also there we, we need to collect some observations. And my research focuses mainly on cities and, uh, and climate. And you probably know that in cities, you have this phenomenon called the urban heat island effect, which means that cities are um, 
often warmer than the surrounding countryside. And during the evening and night hours, uh, cities can be six, seven, even eight degrees warmer than the surrounding countryside. And this uh, urban heat island phenomenon, together with the fact that we have climate change, makes it very relevant to collect data in, uh, in cities. However, as I explained to you, today we do not have a lot of observations in, uh, in cities. And so in 2016, we started at the University of Ghent with a small network in the city of Ghent, where we had six weather stations to collect some data in our city. And we did some, um, some interesting science with, uh, with that. However, at that time, we had already the ambition to build a larger network where we would go to other cities and also other environments. It is, however, quite uh, challenging to set up and maintain this kind of um, networks of, of weather stations. For example, in an urban environment, it's, um, it's challenging to, to find locations. Uh, you need to find uh, a location in the city that is um, representative, that has good uh, scientific um, quality. But at the same time, you need to get permission uh, to, to put there a weather station. You also need to ensure that your weather station is, or that the location is vandalism proof. So it's quite hard to, to build uh, these kind of networks. But in 2019, uh, we had in Belgium a call on, uh, on citizen science. So there was this call to, uh, for funding citizen science projects. And our research group um, thought that, uh, that this might be a very nice opportunity for us to um, realize this, this larger network of, um, of weather stations. And so we started to think on how to realize that. And we uh, ended up with the idea to collaborate with, uh, with schools. At that time in 2019, uh, you might remember that uh, we had these, uh, these strikes for the climate. So our young people came into the streets and they asked for action uh, with respect to, to climate change. So during that period, there was a very strong interest um, at, at schools for information and education on climate and, and atmospheric sciences. So we thought that it might be a very interesting win-win to organize a citizen science project together with, uh, with schools. Um, so we started to um, to, to work on a project and while um, developing this, uh, the, our strategy, we also had a look at, um, at, at for example, this uh, citizen science uh, pyramid. So at the basis of this pyramid, you have, um, you have uh, because actually this pyramid shows the different um, levels of involvement of your citizen scientists. So and at the basis, you have a level where there is minimal involvement of your uh, citizen scientists. So for example, you just ask them to collect some, some data. And the higher you go in the pyramid, the more um, involved the uh, citizen scientists or the schools uh, are. And for example, the, the orange level means that you involve them in the analysis of, of the data. And at the red level, the top of the pyramid, you even co-create your, your science together with citizen scientists. So I'm not going to claim that we managed to reach the, the top of the pyramid, but at least while uh, setting up our project, we, we were um, thinking about how to obtain a maximal involvement of our citizen scientists. So in our case, this is about, about the schools. So um, in 2019, um, we, we received uh, funding for our citizen science uh, ID, and then we could, could start to, to do the actual work. So first of all, we launched a call towards uh, schools in, um, in Belgium, and we asked them to come up with interesting locations to put uh, a weather station. So we were looking for locations that were addressing this scientific gap, for example, uh, locations in, in, the, in the center of, uh, of cities. And we, we got an overwhelming response. So we received more than 450 proposals for locations, but we only had a budget for 60 weather stations. So at that time, that, that, that meant that we had to disappoint most of the schools and we were only able to, to, to put 60 weather stations. After the selection of the locations, we um, sent a box with all the components of the stations to the schools. And it was up to the students to build the weather stations. 
So they received the sensors, the data logger, battery, solar panel, and so on. And they had to build and install the uh, weather stations. By the end of 2019, our network was operational. So the, the weather stations were sending their data, but the job was not yet done for the schools. They had to follow up the measurements. If there was a problem, they had to go to the station and try to, to solve it. And of course, we also stimulated them to, to work with the data and to do data analysis. Um, all these stations, they were sending data, and these data, they are coming in uh, every five minutes. So we are collecting temperature measurements, precipitation, pressure, and so on. All these data um, are communicated via Internet of Things technology, and they are, end up at, uh, at our server at the university. But we decided to uh, build a dashboard, an online dashboard, where all these data would be available in real time. So you can visit this uh, link and you will see there the, uh, the data that we, that we recently uh, received. And actually having all this data in an open way uh, online available was a very nice um, uh, or, or had, a, had a large added value for, for this project because in this way, other, um, other um, people who were not involved in the project could uh, discover our, our project and our data. And this resulted in, in, in other collaborations. And to give you just one example, um, in Belgium, one of our national newspapers um, is uh, discovered this, uh, this dashboard. And during heat waves, they are taking our data and they are showing the real-time temperature measurements of our network on their homepage of, of their news uh, website. Of course, in this project with schools, it was very important to, um, to provide the schools with interesting um, and reliable information that they can use in, in the classroom. So when we started the project, we developed uh, online educational material related to climate, related to the urban heat island uh, effect. And this material also included uh, very practical exercises where the students could work with their measurements and, and do a data analysis. So here you see uh, a screenshot of, 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 of the online material. So it's developed in, in a Google Sites uh, environment. And we developed the material together with some teachers to, to make sure that we develop something that is actually useful uh, for, for them. All the material is openly available, but uh, you, you will maybe see that this is uh, um, written in, in Dutch. After two years, we um, asked for some feedback from, from the teachers that, um, that um, have a weather station. And we saw that part of them was actually actively using this material in the, in the classroom. But there was also a second group that was um, using this material just as a source of inspiration. And then they developed their own, um, um, their own uh, courses for, uh, for, for the class. And then we had a third group of teachers, very honest teachers, and they said uh, that they did not use it uh, up to now. So they were not using the data, they were not using the online educational uh, material that we developed. So we uh, decided that we, um, that we would start with a second um, way uh, to try to activate uh, these schools and to even lower the threshold to work with the data that they were collecting. So we, we set up uh, so-called workshops, Vlinder workshops, where, um, that were organized at, at the schools. And um, during these workshops, the, the pupils, they, um, they got some, uh, some uh, theoretical background on climate, climate change, heat stress, uh, urban heat islands, and so on. And then they also had to work with, with their data and um, they had to make an analysis of the heat stress during a 2020 heat wave um, in, in Belgium. One of the nice things of this workshop was that it um, was supervised by university students. So at Ghent University, we have a program, a postgraduate program on weather and climate modeling. So every year we have a group of students who are really uh, very well aware um, um, about the topic of, of weather and climate. And we asked these university students to go to the schools and to supervise these, um, these workshops. And, th and this worked very well. So the schools were, were very enthusiastic about, this, uh, about these uh, workshops. 
And also for our university students, um, this was really um, a very interesting experience. So for most of these uh, university students, it was the first time that they were teaching. And some of them um, informed me that it was really an, an eye-opening experience for them to, um, to have this teaching um, in, uh, in, in a school. So we will, we will repeat this, uh, this idea of the workshops again um, in, the coming, in the coming months. When you organize a project with, with schools, in our case, we have about 50 schools, you always have some outliers, some, some positive uh, outliers and some uh, less positive outliers. But here on this slide, I would like to show some examples of, um, of, of the positive outliers. So we had some schools where we had teachers that really went uh, far beyond what, what we expected. So for example, there was one school where they really uh, did a lot with the data and, and it was not only the science teachers who were active, but also, for example, the language uh, teachers were involved. And so this school, they, they won a prize for the best uh, geography lecture of, of, of the year. There was another example of a school where they did a, a very thorough, uh, thorough anal analysis of, of a heat wave with that data. And this analysis was then uh, pub published in, uh, in a newspaper. So we had some very, very nice um, experience with, uh, with some of the schools and, and students. When we are talking about citizen science, I think uh, it's very important to not forget about the science. Um, so in our um, experience, um, it is really very, um, very good to have a strong scientific story. If you try to convince people or, or schools to do an effort um, for, your, for your project, then it's very important to um, have a strong, sound scientific story such that they are motivated and such that they know what they are collaborating uh, for. And in our case, it, it, it's a quite easy story, of course, because we, we had a gap in, in, in data. We, we had no knowledge in, in um, or we had not a lot of data in, in, in cities and we were looking for that. And for, for, for our um, project, it's, it's quite easy to convince people to, to participate and, and they understand what, what we are doing with the data. Huh? So we are using them for urban heat island studies in Belgium, but our National Meteorological Institute is also using these data uh, for the evaluation of the, of the weather forecasts. I would also like to stress that if you start with this kind of, of project, citizen science project, that you um, uh, end up with, uh, with a very large audience and a very large uh, network, a network that is otherwise completely out of reach. And this kind of, of very broad network um, can result in, in new projects and new collaborations. And I would like to illustrate this again with an example of, of our uh, uh, project with, with the weather stations. So you know that we were working together with schools, but most of these schools had very close um, contacts with the city administrations. So often they had a meeting, for example, with the city to discuss potential locations in their city for a weather station. And because of this close contact between school and city, we, in the end, uh, also um, came into um, contact with many of the cities. And this connection resulted in uh, new collaborations between uh, our uh, research team and, uh, and several cities. And one illustration uh, here is um, the picture at the bottom uh, left, where you see a, a weather station. And it's a weather station at the market square of the city of uh, St. Nicolas. And this summer, we had a campaign there uh, where we were measuring all parameters that you need to quantify uh, heat stress. And so we had a measurement campaign. And in a few months, they will start um, large uh, works on, on this market square. And in the near future, this market square will be uh, completely different. So at the top right of this slide, you can see a, a rendering of the future market square. So you see that in, in the future, it will be a green square with a with, with lot of trees, with water and so on. And so in 2025, we will come back to this new market square and we will do again similar measurements. And in this way, we can quantify together with the city the impact of, of this kind of urban greening projects on thermal comfort and on uh, heat stress. 
And we have similar projects in other Belgian cities. And so this collaboration is a, a very nice example of the added value of doing citizen science. Okay, I would like to finish with some take home messages uh, based on our experience with citizen science and collaborations with, uh, with schools. So first of all, citizen science really creates novel scientific possibilities. We would never have been able to set up this kind of, of, of network without our collaboration with, uh, with schools. The second uh, point is that schools are really very interested and motivated to work together with universities and people from academia on science. So for climate, um, uh, there is of course a very strong interest, but also for other scientific topics, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, sure that they are also willing to, to participate. A third point is that if you have real-time data, please make them available and, and try to make them openly available because this will, again, create many other opportunities. And uh, for example, other research teams might discover your data and might, um, might start doing research also with your data. So it's really, for us, it was really positive to share the data, to have them openly available in real-time online. A fourth point is that um, you need to think long term already at the start or even before the start of, uh, of a citizen science project. Because if you start a citizen science project, it's not so easy to stop it. Um, for example, in our case, we have an, a whole infrastructure that is out there in, in our country. We have all these weather stations. We have many schools that are using the data. So it's impossible to, to, to just stop this kind of, uh, of project. So even before you start, you need already a long-term vision for your project. And that is very, very challenging, especially um, in a context where most of the science funding is project-based. Uh, and then my final um, remark um, is that when you start this kind of project, you should not underestimate the capacity that you need to manage such a project. So of course you need scientific expertise, but you also need expertise on, on communication, you need um, expertise in, in education. And so you really need a broad and strong team to, um, to do such, uh, such a project. Okay, I hope that this presentation might um, inspire you to also consider doing citizen science or collaborations with, with schools, because for us at least it was a very, very positive uh, experience. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Stephen, for your presentation. We now have time for some questions, and I think you could leave your video on, Stephen, if you want to. Um, so if anybody from of the attendees has a question, please just type them into the chat box or if any of um, the panelists have questions, just um, raise your, your arm. Otherwise, I would just start with some questions. Um, Stephen, I was wondering, how did you choose these schools? Did you just choose them on kind of like geographical measures of which, which ones offered you the, the best locations? Or did you consider kind of social factors to have like a diversity of schools with different demographics to be quite inclusive? Or was that difficult to manage for you? Well, actually, um... You, you mentioned the most important factors for us. So we, we, we had the luxury that we had uh, many, many locations. And so then we decided uh, to, of course, have a look at the scientific value of the locations. Um, but we also tried to have a geographical spread over our country. And we also tried to take into account that in Belgium, we have different type of, uh, of schools, more technical schools, more art schools, and so on. And we try to have um, so also some diversity in the schools there and not only to go to, let's say, the usual suspects for this kind of um, collaborations with, uh, with universities. Yeah. Thank you. And then I have a question for Birgit as well. I just keep on. Um, I wondered, you talked about like that certain of course, universities or certain regions, certain countries benefit more from open access than others so far. I wondered if you also looked at like different linguistic communities. Of course, we know English is kind of like has the most currency in research. Is there any sort of kind of campaigns or strategies to kind of strengthen smaller linguistic communities through open access in that European project, maybe? Um, not in the context of the project, but um, in some countries you have approaches um, 
to um, set up own infrastructures. I mean, for example, in Latin, in Latin America, you have a platform which is shared across Latin American countries, jointly funded. And also in, for example, the Nordic countries, you have um, journal hosting, um, collaborative hosting of journals, which are independent journals without a fee. So there is, um, typically it's independent journals, uh, which are then maintaining and coming up with joint strategies to, to not being bought and maybe then closed down by a publisher, which also happens, of course, with, with journals in all, I mean, more in the sciences. Um, so it's typically humanities, social sciences journals, which um, look for opportunities in the um, own environment or yeah, national solutions or sometimes regional solutions. But there's still, of course, yeah, gaps in terms of availability. I mean, as you said, I mean, you have not published in an open access journal, and this might also be due to, yeah, there's not so many in some fields. <laughs> so, and for some, it's uh, yeah, rather broad availability or these these um, um, where they are in packages. Like in Germany, we have quite a few national agreements, which makes it easier. If it's like an author publishes with a Springer journal or a Wiley journal or some some agreements which are in place. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Julia, maybe I have a question for you. Um, so, if I understand it correctly, your your study focused on the UK. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the situation in, 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 in other uh, countries like Germany or France is, is, is quite different or is it very similar? Com I mean, comparing the UK to the German context is very, very different in terms of the idea of how ethnicity even is perceived and how, I mean, with the history of empire, I think you just have a different diversity just in terms of visibility. I do not believe you have necessarily more power to negotiate how this visibility looks like. But I would say the German media sphere, I think is, is more homogenous in that, in that sense due to a different history. And I would say also that the German sphere specifically in terms of technology, we seem to be a bit behind maybe, and as well of how the media functions. So I would say kind of the, the access to Instagram might be the same, but people use it very, very differently. And I think you do not have these, these, these figures using their access in the same quite efficient and quite impressive way as, as they do in the UK. I think, I don't know how it is in Belgium and you're just in your, how you perceive this, but I think Germany functions extremely different to the UK. Um, and it's it's also the formats, right? It's not just the media, but um, how the media engage with the public. <laughs> I would think, of uh, course, like these, these regular. I mean, I, I came across the Bake Off <laughs> <laughs> because I was reading, yeah, BBC journals. Uh, you know. Yeah, of course. The, the, I think just the format of reality yeah. TV is mm. is a format that is extremely powerful in the UK and in the US context. And of course, we borrow these formats and kind of, I mean, German um, programs, they just buy these formats and implement them. I would say, however, that how the public engages with them is a complete different level in the UK. The popularity of those and the participation in those really is, is very, much, much higher than in the German context. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the power of television. Yeah. We are at seven now. So if, if there are any urgent questions or important questions, we still have time for them. Other than that, I think we could move to the other room, which Alexandra Thank just you. has <laughs> yeah, which Alexandra just has posted the link for. So I want to um, really thank the attendees that have um, stayed with us until the end and all the panelists for their brilliant presentation. It was really fun and diverse and it's it's i've never presented in a context which has diverse speakers so it's really fun to do that for once once in a while and hopefully see you on the other side at, in the work adventure room and um
closing that room now, I guess.